Right, class, today we're continuing our look at the Constitution. We're going to kind of look at some issues with the economy and do some little economics before moving into this big event called Shays Rebellion, which is really going to shift the momentum of our nation in a different direction. So if we review, remember, we're, we're under the Articles of Confederation, our first Constitution. Very, very weak national government by design to avoid being like Britain. So they couldn't tax, which means you don't have an army, really, even though you can technically raise one, you don't have much one to fight with. You can declare war, which again, you can't pay for it. So it's really, really difficult. Then meanwhile, we've got tariffs between all different, there's no regulation states. It's a big old mess. So this led to them uh, having an economic depression that kind of breaks out right after the Revolutionary War. So as we look at number one of our notes, economic depression occurring right after the Revolutionary War on one point. And, you know, when we think of depression and, you know, our personal, we think of, you know, okay, we're kind of slowed down, we're kind of sad, things aren't going well. Well, it's kind of a similar idea with the economy. The economy has slowed down and it's high unemployment. We're putting this down on 1.2. And so under the Articles of Confederation, they're going to really try and avoid having this economic depression. But unfortunately, again, there's, it's such a weak national government, there's nothing they can really do. You know, our national government nowadays struggles with dealing with economic recessions and depressions. They spend hundreds of billions of dollars and it still doesn't have like dramatic effects they want. Certainly back under the Artists Confederation, our national government was going to really, really struggle. But, you know, we live in a market economy or capitalism, you might sometimes hear. It has a thing called the market cycle. So we're on number two of our notes. And it goes like a clock here. So you've got prosperity, recession, depression, and recovery. And just kind of based on the names, you can find kind of here at prosperity, you're prosperous. That's where we want to spend the most amount of time. That's where times are good. Low unemployment, good wages, people are buying lots of stuff, lots of things are being produced. Then things slow down and we have a recession. And so this is where, you know, jobs slowing down. You know, it's not terrible yet, but, you know, you really seen a big dip in the economy. A lot of people have lost jobs. They're not spending as much money. Maybe they're unemployed or a lot of times we hear underemployed. You know, they have a job, but they're not making as much money as they would like. Getting as many hours a month. Depression, again, is that real bad time high unemployment, slow economic growth. But again, like in our normal lives, you know, depression can't last forever. Things eventually have to get better. It's recovery. And eventually you work your way back to prosperity and it'll work around and around and around. Okay. And our government hopes that we save the most time in prosperity and the least time in depression. So if we kind of look, this is kind of our entire national, as you kind of see, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. So that's kind of the model we would see throughout our nation's history. Well, anyways, if we, as we jump back to the 1780s, we have this group of people that are really affected. That's farmers debt. And it's important to remember how many people in the nation back then are farmers. It's a huge, huge job. Well, they basically were asked during the Revolutionary War if they would go into more debt to, you know, produce more crops to support the war effort. And the national government couldn't really pay them that well back then. So they basically gave IOUs. Well, now they start paying back the national these farmers with this national currency. But remember, they also uh, had all this national currency printed off to pay this war debt back to foreign banks and the French and whatnot. So we've had in massive inflation. So all that money now the farmers have been paid is not worth as much. These farmers, they go to the bank and they offer to pay off their debt. But the banks don't accept the paper money anymore because because of inflation, they're not accepting this paper money, which means now because of inflation, farmers can't pay off their war debt. That's 3.1. So back then, you know, if you can't pay back your debt, you become what's called a debtor, and you can even be thrown in special prison just for debtors. This is a big, big problem. So we have this character in the story, and his name is Daniel Shays, and he's going to end up leading a rebellion. What we have here is it's kind of focused in western Massachusetts. It's rising tension. And we've got petitioning and protesting and organizing that all starts happening. We have these, you know, county conventions are getting together. They're saying, you know, we need to change government policy. We need to protest and petition. Well, that's not working. And if we think back, I mean, these tactics of petitioning and protesting, they learned from the Sons of Liberty and the people who had been around the revolution. You guys, we're only, you know, we're a decade or less removed from the revolution. So it's a lot of the same people. And so a lot of these same more tactics are getting is, well, when petitioning and protesting hadn't got the job done during the revolution, they turned to violence. 
So now we're going to see the same thing happen. So Daniel Shays is a farmer. He's also a Revolutionary War veteran. He's a very good soldier. And his goal, as we look at 4.1, is to stop these debtor courts from meeting. And if you can stop the courts, well, then they can't convict people. And if they can't convict people, then it's going to keep himself, hopefully, and all of his friends that are farmers out of debtor's prison. So long story short, um, what we have is these farmers rise up. They kind of take over the countryside, shut down these courts. looks like they might even march on Boston. I mean, it's absolute chaos. Well, of course, you know, the legislature meeting in Boston says, oh, well, we have this chaos breakout. Let's call out the militia, and they'll put down this emergency. That's what they're there for. The problem is the people that serve in the militia are these debtors, are these farmers. So you can't call the militia because they're the ones rebelling. Well, who are you going to call it then? Well, maybe call it the National Army. Oh, wait, dang it, Articles of Confederation. We don't have a National Army that's very strong. They can't put it down. So for a long time, these farmers are kind of allowed for several months to just shut down West Massachusetts. It could start spreading. And the, con the entire country might you know, collapse here. It's a big, big problem. Eventually, the banks and some of the rich people kind of pay for these mercenary troops coming and put down their land. But again, if you're the national government, this is not making you at ease. You have, on one hand, these upset farmers who have risen up and a mercenary army, and you can't do anything about either one of them. So it's the tipping point on 4.2, and it leads to the Constitutional Convention. And again, it shows Americans, you know, we need a stronger central government. We need a stronger national government. Yes, we don't want to be like Britain, but man, a farmer rebellion can almost bring the country down. What would happen if the British or the Spanish rose up? What if the Native Americans band together again and attack us? What are we going to do? So we need a constant convention to talk about making a new type of government.